Welcome back, everybody. Uh, welcome to the afternoon session of the 36th uh, James Young, 36th Annual James Young Colloquium. And uh, in the afternoon session, we have a special pleasure of hearing from three of our um, UCR anthropology faculty members that we hold in very high esteem, uh, Dr. Yolanda Moses, Dr. Christine Gailey, Dr. Wendy Ashmore, and then uh, we also have a special guest, keynote speaker, Dr. Robert Painter, uh, visiting from University of Massachusetts Amherst. So uh, we're gonna get started with our first speaker, Dr. Yolanda Moses. Dr. Moses currently serves as professor of anthropology and the associate vice chancellor for diversity, equity, and excellence at the University of California, Riverside. Dr. Moses's research focuses on the broad question of the origins of social inequality in complex societies through the use of comparative ethnographic and survey methods. She has explored gender and class disparities in the Caribbean, East Africa, and in the United States. More recently, her research has focused on issues of diversity and change in universities and colleges in the United States, India, Europe, and South Africa. She's currently involved with several national higher education projects with the National Council for Research on Women, Campus Women Lead, and the Women of Color Research Collective. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Yolanda Moses. Hello, everybody. Hi. Hope you had a good lunch. That means you'll be awake for this part of the program, right? Um, I am going to lead this off in, in, in doing so in trepidation because I am going to be followed by um, other uh, folks who will have other things to say about the contributions of their relationship with Tom Patterson and knowledge production theory and standpoint. What I want to do, and I don't have any slides, any PowerPoint, so uh, what I want to do is to go back to some of the things that I said in my, um, and, and to keep track of time. Well, what I said in my um, uh, abstract, oh, is that the one? I thought it was that one. Okay, what I said <clears throat> in my abstract about how uh, the, Tom's work helped to open up new ways of thinking uh, for me, particularly around issues of um, uh, race and racial formations and intersectionalities. And he has challenged us at the micro le macro level to go back and look anew at what we think we know or what we think we knew about certain kinds of issues particularly around issues of resistance, the role that resistance has played um, in, <clears throat> in, um, our, in modernization in, in our own country, but in other countries. And our country is important because my work, particularly around um, racial formations, has been in, in the US as it relates to the race project. And we're getting ready to do race 2.0. And so it was a good time for me to stop and take stock of what we were doing here because the work that we'll be doing next will put anthropology on a global stage around this project. And so looking for ways to engage that is really, really important. So uh, Tom <clears throat> has helped me to rethink what resistance means in this context. The listening to the voice of the other, even when it seems to be muted, you know, what are people saying, and cultivating this deep understanding of the relationship of people to their environments and to the modes of production. Those two things are, are linked, and we sometimes um, uh, take those apart, as well as understanding the strong relationships between notions and understandings of stratification social stratification, which we see, and the intersectionalities around those stratifications. So those are the, um, the ways in which I have engaged <clears throat> the work in my own work. And particularly when I look at 
uh, the book, his book, Myth of Western Civilization, he's, he's really provided us a way to look at um, the fact that what we call civilization, what we call progress, what we call all those words that give us a forward-looking projection are, in fact, social constructions. These are not natural. These are, none of this is found naturally in the world. But the language around it, the structures that are built around it, give us a sense that, in fact, they are. And he's challenging us to relook at that again. So the fact that not only does civilization not stand in opposition to nature, but our relationship to nature is also something that was socially constructed. And being in that privileged position in a socially stratified society allows ruling classes to at the simultaneously create and uncreate those kinds of uh, opportunities to maintain social position, to, re to maintain that position. And understanding that is really, really important that the erasure of culture and the creation of culture are in the hands of that group of people. And that has to be challenged in ways that we perhaps have not done that before. Looking at our own history, <clears throat> the working, class, uh, working classes of the 19th century were uh, divided by race and ethnicity and were not able to form that class formation. And in the 21st century, one of the questions is, we have an opportunity to do that when we take advantage of that in the 21st century, to do that the way we could have done in the 19th century. And I think it's really important that he has said that uncivilized people have always had a voice in the process. It has been sometimes muted, it has been sometimes silenced, but it has always been there. And it's something that we need to continue to um, challenge. So what are the ways in which uncivilized, the uncivilized folks have challenged dominant structure, dominant social structure, dominant hierarchy? Well, one of the ways is by subverting um, dominant understandings of the natural order. That is, who says it's natural? Who gets to name it? Who gets to push back against it? And it's in these resistances that we see this happening. Um, it, we go back and look at 19th century, the um, uh, lynchings of the 19th century, uh, he mentioned around Ida B. Wells and her work in the race uplift movement. And I clearly see relationships more recently to uh, black students here in American public universities with hashtag Black Lives Matter being a way to showcase and to move from the margins to the center narratives that have been subdued or muted. Yes, all lives matter, but hashtag Black Lives Matter is sending a particular message to a larger population who bought who drank the Kool-Aid that all lives matter and that the government is acting accordingly or people in power are acting accordingly around that. The second thing that um, unci uncivilized voices have challenged is the fact that gender hierarchy um, is shaped also by race and class. And this is something that Tom points out in his work. And Power and success are gendered in Western society. As anthropologists, we look at uh, maleness, femaleness, uh, other kinds of, of gender categories in ways that push back against the notion that there is uh, one way to look at gender and that uh, that gender hierarchy is one that is um, fixed and that it is uh, again part of the looking at what is called the national the, the natural order um, it's uh, 
again, if we think about what is happening today in the headlines of our newspapers, and it's something I challenge my students to do all the time, is to tie what we're doing in our anthropology classes with what they're seeing in the, in the media, particularly in cultural anthropology. Uh, so historically, uh, privileged classes were able to um, uh, make changes. And the privileged classes were also marked as white. It is being challenged today uh, economically, if you look at since 2008, that the so-called middle class has been on a downside, a downward spiral. And what we're seeing are people who are in that class position of middle class who are white and perhaps uneducated or not as educated have lost their homes. They've lost their jobs. They've lost, they believed in that narrative and that narrative is no longer true for them. And they are angry. And they are angry, and you see that anger in terms of, of how they work. So how do we understand that as anthropologists? I think the way um, uh, uh, Tom has given us ways to, to do that. And <clears throat> finally, the importance of class, which we haven't historically talked about in this country. The importance of class in a context that is shaped by race and gender is the way that we have to think about moving forward. We've always had class dynamics. We just have not called them out in the way that we are doing now, or at least the resistant voices are doing now in the, in the movement. So we see these in forms of strikes. We see these in the form of students who are pushing back against the notion that there is a polite way to protest and a polite way to raise questions so that people who are in power are not made to feel uncomfortable, right? So that is, no, that is not the, the case. Students are challenging the systems within higher education. So if we think about social and cultural hierarchies of civilized societies as not being natural, but are maintained at the expense of structured exploitative social relationships, then we must lay those bare in our work. And <clears throat> that is what we're being challenged to do. We cannot continue to treat, as Tom says, this notion of civilization uncritically. Like, who decided that? Who gets to name that? Who is included and who is excluded in that work? <clears throat> um, Self-proclaimed arbiters of culture and social knowledge only go so far in that they only focus on a small uh, sliver of the diversity of um, social groups, social organizations, and social change agents that are in a society. And this notion um, of there being a way to do it that is privileged not only in terms of who makes policy and who makes laws, but also how it gets communicated. And that has to do with the fourth estate or the media and how the media portrays these realities as if they are in everyone's lives. And what this does is uh, trivialize and undercut the accomplishments of subordinated classes and communities and denies their members um, roles in making their own history. And this is something that we're challenged to push back against. That as anthropologists, we have to, we should be giving agency and voice to people who can shape and make their own lives or talk about that. So that's the first uh, part of what I'm going to do. In the second part of the second section of this presentation, I want to show how these themes resonate with my own work on what I'm calling race formation 2.0 in terms of moving forward. Um, issues, again, around resistance, 
issues again around reformation, reforming what we think we know, and uh, also then the creation of new possibilities, new ways of knowing, new theories, new theorizing around racial formations. So <clears throat> in my work, um, we focus pretty much on the U.S. because the U.S. was such a complex system of, of, of racialization. That's where we wanted to focus. 2.0, we want to go global, as I said. Racial formations in the 21st century take us to old and new intersections beyond the borders of the United States, back to biology, and back to the unfinished business of dismantling structural racism here in the United States and beyond. <clears throat> so there's research in this area of, of looking at race, racialization. One of these is in um, the area of intersectionality. So we're looking at intersectionality um, in a different way, intersectionality as, ba as a fundamentally gendered and sexualized process, and arguing that rather than being stable, these intersections are unstable, they're historically pro produced and contextual, and changing in the ways that <clears throat> complicates the meaning of intersectionality. We're complicating that um, meaning more. And it is precisely this intentional interrogation of the historical embeddedness of race, gender, sexuality, and class with each other that will, we think, produce a new way of, of looking at intersectionality for the purposes of, the, of this project. <clears throat> We're also looking at uh, uh, liberation movements, social movements around this issue. And the um, movements are not just social, we want to go beyond the social agitation and get sort of underneath that to show that there were historiographical provocations that push people to think differently about um, racial identity and, different, and difference. Um, and it, for example, if we go back and look at the civil rights movement, we know that there was, there was a civil rights movement. But do we know about the contested nature of the civil rights movement, the diversity within those movements that actually helped to create broader notions of what civil and civil rights were. That is, to, to the extent that um, <clears throat> marginalized uh, folks back in the 60s, gays, gays lesbian, um, sexual, um, uh, uh, gender, was taking into account in these movements helped to strengthen these movements and to make them stronger movements. And those are the things that we're trying to, to understand and to get at by listening to the subaltern voices within the subaltern communities, right? So it's digging a bit deeper in there. So both civil rights movements and <clears throat> Uh, national liberation movements cross-culturally to see how race and anti-racist politics are re-articulated re in, in those movements. Um, where do we go from here? Well, I think that future research on racial formation, r racial formations should focus, among other things, on relationships among anti-racist groups, women's groups, anti-colonial, anti-imperial, uh, groups and labor-based anti-poverty movements. These are movements that have been parallel. They've, they've had parallel trajectories in terms of how we think about these issues, but in Race Formations 2.0, these will all be integrated. Now, don't ask me how I'm going to do it, but that's, <laughs> that's what we should be doing, right? <laughs> Reality exists on the political right. And um, there's also a powerful intersectionality reali uh, reality that exists on the political right here in the US and in Europe and other places where anti-feminists, anti-labor blame the victim 
oriented, homophobic, and ambiguously anti-racist orientations operate um, <clears throat> and need to be interrogated because these are the publics that we encounter every day. And in looking cross uh, culturally, internationally, it will be the same way. So we need more research that investigates the instability and in practice of intersectional situations and social structures in general. For example, how do individuals and movements uh, navigate among the race, gendered, queer, trans, sexual, class, and caste-based uh, dimensions of social, cultural, and political life? What is the relationship between intersectionality and indigeneity, for example? What are the elusive linkages among identity and difference and between alliance and antagonism? There is also um, a need for historical views of intersectionality in the US and transnationally. Are they the same? Um, what are the emerging contested views and definitions of intersectionality itself? You know, that has different meanings in different places. Is it a local and a global uh, phenomena? Are they different in those contexts? Um, and to what extent is intersectionality and post-coloniality, oh, these big words, intersectionality and post-colonialism connected? And what are the newly emerging theories around intersectionality and the politics of identity? So we need the frameworks to do this work. We need the methodologies to do this work. And um, by highlighting micro, macro linkages and problems, um, we're trying to do more of an integrated, comparative, uh, and historical uh, context. So finally, I would say that race is about continues to be about power relations and continues to be an ideology to legitimize the dominance of certain groups in society. Race and its consequence, uh, racism, is fundamentally and inexorably part of a global system of structural racial stratification and inequality. People indoctrinated in US individualism, and that's us who stand here as the exceptional people, uh, American exceptionalism, we often have difficulty understanding these abstract notions of a social system that is pretty much invisible to some people in our society. Uh, what social stratification is and how one's social position impacts individual experience and opportunities. Um, over time, we've seen the fluctuation in definitions of the other. There's been also some fluctuation in the definition um, of whiteness in our society, which reflects demands for population growth in some ways against a backdrop, again, of powerful elites seeking to maintain a system of social stratification and cultural dominance. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a, in a uh, society that is um, so diverse, or becoming so diverse. The U.S. race-based system of social classification actually became a way historically of maintaining the dominance of, of, a, uh, of a group. And uh, socially and politically, so that you could maintain that position and also have the narrative of inviting in new populations. And these new populations were invited in to be a part of this mixture of people who um, supposedly uh, got along with each other. So there, there's a sense of maintaining the dominance politically while simultaneously recruiting new populations. So th this became a way to create um, a central basis for organization, and thank you, Tom, for this, uh, organizing labor and maintaining an economically stratified and racialized system at the same time. First, if we go back in our agricultural sector in, of the society, and now in our uh, post-industrial um, uh, uh, sectors of our society, in our newly emerging sectors of high tech 
and uh, technological um, innovation. So racializing the labor force has historically helped to mask the pervasive class stratification and structural inequality that has always been a part of American life. It is not new. It has always been there. The North American system of racial classification is most accurately viewed as a historically and culturally specific legitimizing ideology. And our goal as anthropologists is to interrogate that process of legitimization and to suggest alternative models through resistance, through um, uh, struggle. <clears throat> so we have had a complex and unique way of explaining, justifying, and perpetuating a system of social, economic, and political inequality. And what appears to be the natural order is not. What appears to be unchallenged is being challenged. This has been the case in the past with the subaltern voices that are just coming forward, that are just being um, broadcast, even in anthropology. Um, anthropologists like McCall Smith. I'd never heard of McCall Smith. And I'm, you know, consider myself to be a railroad anthropologist until Tom researched and brought him forward. If this man's voice had been a part of the anthropological narrative in the late 19th century, the whole trajectory of American anthropology could have been different, but he was shut out. And that has to be a part of our legacy as well. The contestation is in the past, the contestation is now, and the contestation will be continued. Thank you, Tom. So I think we have time for a few questions. Tried to keep it that way. Anybody have any comments? <laughs>